the teenage dream to me is a place where no one gets bullied. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my Wicked Winter series. I'm Brooke McKenna and this is another one in my 31 days of continuous content for you guys in December. But today's case is about the Miss Irresistible murders. You know, being a teenager can be a very tricky thing. You don't know who your true friends are. You don't really have the best self-confidence. But in this case, it was taken to the extreme. And they almost got away with it too. If you are looking forward to me posting every single day, I would love your support by me talking about these creepy things by just subscribing if you're not already. Now let's get back to the story. So it was July 18th of 2003 in Clear Lake, Texas, and an 18-year-old girl named Tiffany Rowell was actually throwing a small party at her family's home at 3706 Millbridge. She invited her 19-year-old boyfriend named Marcus Ray Priscilla, and he invited his 21-year-old cousin named Adelbert Nicholas Sanchez. She also invited her best friend who is 18-year-old Rachel Colarutes, and they were just having fun. It was Friday afternoon at about 3 p.m. and they were watching TV and eating pizza. A neighbor heard a noise at about 3.30 p.m. but just thought it was some sort of hammering going on in the neighborhood, so they didn't think much of it. But another group of friends that were friends with Tiffany as well decided to head over at about 6.30 that evening because this girl who was going by a pseudonym of Brittany in this case, she had called Tiffany to do some sort of business with her, maybe to ask if she could come over at about three o'clock. But Tiffany was actually in the bathroom and so her boyfriend Marcus picked up the phone. When Brittany realized it was Marcus on the phone, she just said, oh, I'll call her back. So she called again a little bit later and nobody answered the phone. So she just thought that she would go ahead and head over to the house at around 6.30. Once they got there, they knocked and knocked and knocked and nobody was coming to the door. And finally, their banging actually opened the door that was unlocked anyways, and so they just walked inside. But what they found was a living room full of blood and dead teenagers. They immediately ran out screaming for help and two neighbors who were in the area ran inside to see what had happened and immediately called the police. They said they were in the living room as though they were all just watching TV innocently. Two were still sitting on the couch with their feet propped up. One was lying on the floor still looking up at the TV and the other one was lying behind the sofa. Once police got there to investigate, they found that everybody had been shot multiple times and Rachel Colarutes had actually been killed from blunt force trauma to the head. They said it looked like it was a slaughterhouse and the only evidence they could find were a few shell casings on the ground. Now, they thought because of the lack of evidence and suspects that it was possibly a drug trade that had gone wrong because Marcus and Adelbert, who were the boys there at the time, were allegedly selling coke and ecstasy at that time. So that's exactly what the police said had happened for a really long time. They said that the girls were also working as waitresses at a local strip club and were possibly doing drugs as well. And so they were either, you know, in that whole scene with them or they were at this place at the wrong time when this drug trade went bad. But neighbors said that there was nothing different about Tiffany Rowell's family and friends, that they were just typical teenagers coming and going. The neighbors said that the Rowells were a good quiet family and that her dad owned the house but didn't really live there and wasn't there at the time because he was visiting her sister in Ohio. But he often didn't live there at all. In fact, Tiffany mostly lived there alone because after her mother had died, her father had remarried and moved in with his next wife. Tiffany may have been home alone a lot, but the neighbors were sure to keep track of her and take care of her when need be, which is probably why the neighbors were so on top of it when they heard screaming coming from that house. They wanted to make sure she was okay but they got there too late. Tiffany and Rachel had both graduated the year prior and were known at Clear Lake High as really nice girls. Tiffany was an amazing actress. She was in multiple school plays and she wanted to become a social worker. Rachel was into art and creative writing and was so beautiful that people thought that she should be a model. But she was also the kind of person that was just as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. And she always wanted to help the underdogs, help people out, make them feel better. While the investigators went inside Tiffany's home to 
investigate what had happened, Rachel's parents came along the scene and there was a crowd already forming outside. Rachel's mother collapsed to the ground and her father demanded to go inside even though they wouldn't let him. They were devastated and had no idea who could have done this, but that's what they needed to figure out. There was zero motive being found and the only suspects that they kind of had was a, a sighting that a neighbor had had of two individuals who were young and white and wearing all black around the same time of the murders. They went to do a police sketch, but the problem was the girl was actually wearing a bandana which made her harder to recognize because with females, hair is a huge identifying factor, but she was wearing a bandana. The only thing they really knew about her was that she had big eyes. The, the drawings that this sketch artist did looked like regular young people, nobody who would do such brutal murders, but they had been seen leaving that scene. So they, they put these pictures together, they sent them out, and they also attached an $100,000 reward for any information about what they were calling the Clear Lake murders. Rachel's father, George, the one who demanded to go inside the house when the scene was first found, he went to work. He publicized the entire case on a website. He was putting up billboards with the sketches around the Houston highways going in and out of Clear Lake so you would have to see them. And he went door to door giving out flyers. He sent mass mailings out and he raised that $100,000 himself. He said he thought that him doing it would make a loud and meaningful impact on the community and possibly get the killers out of hiding. But months were going by and nothing was coming in and the leads were quickly drying up or not turning out with any other information. Then nearly three years later, on July 8th of 2006, a tip was called in to Crime Stoppers and he said that he knew who the girl in the sketches was. He said that he had met her in drug rehab and her name was Christine Paolilla. He said she had admitted to the quadruple murder and had even said that one of them had died while trying to call 911. That is something that was not released to the public and once the police heard that, they knew he was telling the truth and they knew they possibly had their killer. They tracked her down to a hotel room in San Antonio where she was staying with her husband, Justin Rott. They got inside and they said that it looked like a murder scene itself. There was blood all over the walls, there were needles all over the ground, there were empty ones in boxes, there were ones filled with heroin on the dresser. These two were weeks from death from their drug use. They arrested them both for the obvious heroin use on July 19th, but brought her in for questioning of the Clear Lake murders as well. Now, Justin was actually very cooperative, surprisingly. He said that Christine never left that hotel room for nine months, and the only time he left was to get more drugs and food. But he also said she had confessed to him about the murders. She had told him she was an active participant in the murders, and that she actually went back inside to beat Rachel with the gun. Christine, however, denied everything to investigators while being interrogated and said she had nothing to do with it. But after a while, having a withdrawal from her heroin, she was broken down and she admitted that she did it, but it was her boyfriend at the time, her ex now, Christopher Snyder, who led the whole thing. Two days later, Christine and Christopher were charged with capital murder and Christine's bail was set at $500,000, but Christopher had yet to be brought in. He wasn't being found. And what they didn't know was that a family member of Christopher's had told him that the police had a warrant out for his arrest. And once the police knew that he had moved to Greenville, South Carolina, they headed over there. He, he was living with a woman he met online. So when they headed over there, they unfortunately got the tip that he had taken his own life. A team of search dogs who were trained to look for cadavers found a man's body in a wooded area at 7.30 a.m. on August 5th. And the last time Christopher was seen was July 20th when he left his girlfriend's house wearing shorts and a shirt and having no money but a soda and prescription pills. He in fact was the body they found and he had overdosed right across the street from his girlfriend's house. But Christine went to trial on October 13th of 2008 and was charged with four counts of capital murder. 
She was spared the death penalty only because she was a juvenile at the time at only 17 years old. The next day, she was sentenced to life in prison after a three-hour deliberation, but on November 29th, she tried to appeal it, saying that they abused their discretion in setting her bail at $500,000, but that was denied. She is incarcerated at the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas, and is eligible for parole in 2046. But the motive for this case might be the most disturbing because these were Christine's friends. But let's start at the beginning. So Christine Marie Halolilla was born March 31st of 1986 in Long Island, New York. She was raised by her stay-at-home mother, Lori, and her construction worker father, Charles. She also had an older brother named John. But when she was only two years old, her father actually died in a freak accident at work where the bricks fell on top of him, and her grandparents died shortly after that. After that, her mother began a battle with drug addiction, and at the age of seven, she was moved out of her home because her mother was not fit to parent her and moved with her living set of grandparents. But while in kindergarten at about five, she began to experience the symptoms of alopecia, which is basically it attacks your immune system and attacks the hair follicles. So you begin losing your hair on your head, hair on your eyebrows, your eyelashes. She began wearing wigs and had to wear thick glasses because she had such poor vision and in school the children bullied her mercilessly for this often yanking off her wig and taunting her i mean she would wake up with clumps of hair on her pillow that had fallen out overnight and it was devastating to her self-confidence but there was nothing she could do about it she started wearing makeup at a young age to cover the fact that she didn't have eyebrows or eyelashes and eventually, when she got up to high school, her mother actually overcame her addiction and they moved back in with her. She had also remarried at this time, so they moved to a more, you know, upper class home and division in the neighborhood and they moved to Clear Lake. She began Clear Lake High in 2002 as a sophomore. Her mother worried that the bullying would get worse in high school, especially in this more high class high school, but she actually began to make friends with two of the popular girls too. They were Tiffany and Rachel and they were really nice to her. She was so incredibly happy being their friend and comfortable with them and they wanted to take her under their wing. She would wear, not even wear wigs around them sometime, which was a huge thing for her because it was such a huge insecurity of hers. They even at one point gave her this, you know, makeover where they got her a better wig that suited her and looked more natural. They showed her the real way to put on makeup, a better wardrobe that flattered her, just anything to make her feel better about herself. She constantly talked to her mom about them, saying how they were the sweetest girls she had ever met and how loving and fun they were. They even wrote cute little high school notes back and forth to each other that said Christine, Rachel, and Tiffany equals BFFs and there was a note from Tiffany to Christine that said I heart you. You have been there for me when I needed you. I really appreciate how nice you are. Heart Tiff. The girls eventually graduated and since Christine was a year below them, she was still in school but she was fine by this time because the girls had given her so much confidence and happiness and she was even voted Miss Irresistible by the other students. But this also meant she got more attention from boys, including a boy named Christopher Snyder, who was 21 years old. She began dating him then, and even though her mother did not like him, and Rachel and Tiffany weren't too fond of him either. But that wasn't for no reason. He was a frequent drug user and also had a criminal record. This meant that Christine eventually started experimenting with drugs herself and the relationship was super toxic and abusive, but Christopher often made Christine isolate herself from her friends and family, but it did go both ways in the toxicity because Christine was just as abusive. If Christopher was to look at another girl in public, she would lick his face to claim him from that other girl. She also, when they would get in fights, she would try to go to his house and break into his family home where his family was sleeping. And if she couldn't get in, she would spend the night on the front lawn screaming. His family referred to her as psycho. But the night of July 18th, Christine said that 
Christopher had wanted to go in to steal drugs and so that's why they headed in that day. They were obviously let in because they were their friends. But when they walked in the door, she said that Christopher got in a fight with Marcus, who was Tiffany's boyfriend, and that's when the shooting began. She said that she was forced into it with Christopher's hand over hers on the gun. But the coroner report showed that two guns had been going off simultaneously, not like he was teaching her how to do it and also then doing it himself. Rachel tried to crawl to the phone after she had been shot to call 911. Christine went over and hit her repeatedly with the butt of her 38 caliber gun. She was then shot in the crotch as well. Christine said that she was shooting blindly at this time and crying like crazy. And then less than an hour after that, Christopher was dropping her off at her job at Walgreens and she clocked in a little before 4 p.m. to be a cashier at the makeup counter. When it was announced to the public about the murders, Christine's family said that she showed signs of distress but also didn't attend the funerals due to depression. A year later, she went to therapy for her addiction and Christopher actually went to jail for a while for car theft and that is when they finally broke up. Christine was in treatment at Kerrville, Texas and that is where she met Stanley Justin Rott and they fell in love and they vowed to live a life without drugs. They married and Christine had turned 18 at this time, meaning that she finally got her trust fund from her father's death that was $360,000. With that, they bought a condo and lived together. But one night while watching the news, these sketches came up of the murderers of these four individuals from Clear Lake and she saw the sketches and was sent into a panic telling Justin everything. They fled to the hotel so no one would recognize her or see her out in public, but that didn't work because she was caught and jailed. And later on in one of these searches done at Christopher's place, he had a safe that had two guns inside of it and they were matched to the Clear Lake murders. But what I wanna know is yes, Christine was bullied badly as a child, but not by the people that she murdered. So why did she do it? During her trial, mental health professionals said that her years of isolation from this was psychologically scarring and her constant rejection warped her reality and her views of social interaction. They said it could have made her more likely to turn to drugs and violence, but some thought that her jealousy just got the best of her. But was that a good enough excuse for 21 shots fired and four people dead? I don't think so. I mean, there was what's called an overkill found in both the females where they were shot far more times than the men as if somebody really hated them like a deep-rooted hate that had never been brought out before. Christine's family said she's not capable of doing this, saying that what happened was a tragedy, but Christine was as much a victim as the poor kids, and that she's not the one who did this, but the one who did it was gone. All throughout the trial, Rachel's mother was watching Christine, and she said, I really hope to see something in her eyes in the way of remorse, and it was unbelievable. You know, she never shed a tear unless it was for herself. Christine said she never called the police after the murders because she said it was all Christopher's doing, so why wouldn't she call the police? She said she didn't because she was scared of him and what he would do, but yet she called him 1,100 times after the murders. Why would you call someone that many times if you're scared of them? Why would you call them at all? But Christine's husband, Justin, gave the most evidence in this case saying, she had admitted everything to him and slowly was giving more and more details. He said she admitted that Rachel wasn't dead when they left the house, but she wanted to go back in and make sure everybody was dead. And when they went back in, she was choking on her own blood, trying to dial 911, and that is when she started beating her. She said Rachel had asked why she was doing this to her, and she just kept beating her until she was dead. After the verdict of guilty was given, Rachel's father, George, made a statement saying, My daughter didn't die in a car wreck. She wasn't hit by lightning. She perished at the hands of two evil people, cold, calculating, heartless. I asked my wife, what will hurt you the most? Her picture never ages, but we do. Christmas, birthdays, my daughter Tiffany's graduation, 
there is always an absence, always a silence. And Adelbert's sister Nicole said, as we come to a close to this chapter of our lives, we will walk away from this courtroom and forget about Christine. But Christine will think about the four precious innocent lives she brutally took that day and the families that she destroyed every day for the rest of her life. You know, I'm happy Christine is behind bars, whether she was an active participant in the shooting or whether she just watched Christopher do it and kept silent all those years. But what do you think it was? Which one? Did she do it or did she not? I, from what she was telling her husband, I believe she was part of it. I just want to know what made her so angry at the two people who were so kind to her because that just makes me so incredibly sad that they, they, they loved her. They, they, didn't, they didn't care about her differences. They loved her for them. You know, bullying is such a horrible experience for a child to go through. And especially when it's about appearance or something you cha can't change, but is that an excuse to kill, to become a monster? You know, I was bullied pretty badly in middle school. And from that, I learned that getting angry, wanting revenge is giving them the power. You are becoming what they are what they created. Use that pain to become a better person, to help others in that situation and to spread kindness where there isn't any. That is your power. And if you are a bully right now, I want you to know that there is a chance for change. You have the ability to change because I'll admit in elementary school, I was a bossy little girl. I was not the kindest to people but I chose to become a better person through that and you can as well no matter how old you are. You have the ability to change for the better. This is a cycle of anger that we must all stop because we are better than belittling each other for how we look for what we believe in, for who we love. And I hope this case is a lesson for someone out there for what they shouldn't do because it's heartbreaking. And yes, I believe that that little girl went through a lot and little Christine should have never been put through that. But she should have grown up to never want to put anyone else through any sort of pain as an adult. Pain, it doesn't have to breed pain. You can become a better person and break that cycle. And unfortunately, it didn't happen in time for this case. And these victims deserved so much better. But all we can do now is be better. And bullying is such an important topic to me because like I said, I was and it definitely, it scars you, it changes you, but it doesn't have to make you a bad person. So yeah, let me know down below what you think if she was really involved in this or if she was just kind of there and what you think about the whole case in general. Remember to make sure to be subscribed and thumbsing up so you don't miss my content every day because I will see you tomorrow as well. Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. Don't let the hate make you bitter. Make it your goal to never be like them, and then don't be a quitter.